If so, Christy, over to you. Okay, thank you, Michael. <laughs> Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you today about a dual perspective on move, students when they move from school to university. Um, I know there are some people who are in the audience that do know me, but for those of you that don't, um, I have a fairly unique position in the UK in that I do teach in both a school and a university. Um, so I've been a qualified teacher for nearly 15 years now, um, but since 2015, I have been working both at the University of Manchester in the Department of Chemistry and still in school as well. Uh, and over last year, I've taken on the role of um, year one tutor. Um, so a lot of my teaching is concentrated in the early years of our undergraduate program, but I also run projects in third and final year as well. Um, so first I wanted to bring your attention to a few surveys that run every year that deal with this aspect of transition. Um, the first one here is a survey of year 13 students, which is put out by HMC and GSA, which are the leading independent schools body. Um, every year they survey around 2000 students about their expectations around going to university and what they think might happen and what they're excited about and what they're worried about. Um, as you can see, I'm not gonna read the slides to you, but you can see from their responses that they they are very, very varied. So um, you, you might think potentially that um, independent school students are exclusively of a particular type, um, but you can see from this that there are a significant number expressing concern about some aspect of university life, whether that is independent study or peer groups, social lives, that kind of thing. Um, so this is also consistent with data that is collected by HEPI. So HEPI will um, uh, do a survey of first years each year, which I'll just move this on to. So the latest version of this um, does show that there are growing issues with mental health and loneliness. And actually um, loneliness in particular is one thing that, that does concern me in the changes that have been made to student accommodation um, and an increasing tendency to be living alone in studio flats rather than having that kind of communality that used to exist when those of us who were in kind of normal halls with shared bathrooms, shared kitchens used to have. Um, it's probably perhaps wise for us to put aside um, uh, any kind of idealistic views about why students go to university and that they're pursuing some lofty academic dreams um, most students are going to university for purely practical reasons. Uh, it is a way to just um, get where they want to be, to gain access to a particular job um, or to have a bit of a transition to being an adult in a supported kind of way. Um, so that might shatter a few illusions for some of us. Um, if you want to read more about this, it's probably time for me to mention that I have written much more extensively on this um, in the now famous yellow book. Um, so you can read a lot about that kind of at your own pace. Um, and that's actually my chapter is hosted online on my blog as well. So let's have a think about transition points to start with. Um, a few general points. Any educational transition phase is challenging. Um, there is significant evidence that all of them, whether it's going from um, home to nursery or from nursery to primary school, that all of them do have a temporary effect on student progress as they adjust to their new education setting. Um, for students that are starting this autumn, following the COVID um, crisis, I, this has been a bit more um, abrupt than usual. So some of them were cast adrift by their schools in March when they knew that anything that they did after lockdown wasn't going to count for exams. Um, so essentially, they might have been on an extended transition because they haven't been in school, um, but it has been completely abrupt as well. Um, so there's the potential that this may be even more challenging, especially as the environment that they're going into is not the one that they would necessarily have expected to when they were applying for their courses. So the transition to higher education is actually one of the least regulated ones. Um, so if you go to, um, you know, when my daughter, when it comes to it, she goes to high school, some information will go with her, actually quite a lot of information. Um, because students are independent adults, they only come with a certain amount of information that will get through their matriculation papers. So um, things like their prior achievement profile, their name, their address, their age, those kind of things. Um, and because they're independent adults and some of them will be um, maybe reinventing a version of themselves, they might not disclose very much about themselves either. Um, 
so actually you won't know very much about these students when they appear um, and building really strong trust between tutors and students is especially important because of this, um, because of the limited information, you, you don't know very much about them. Um, this diagram looks at the kind of broad themes that are there in transition. Um, so I'll look at these in order, but primarily there are kind of four big themes, which are the background factors, your class and cohort connectedness, um, aspects of teaching, learning and feedback and aspects of curriculum and assessment, um, which I'll leave to last for a particular reason. Okay, so your background factors. Every student's got a set of characteristics. Um, they may help or they might hinder their transition. Um, there is loads and loads of literature on at-risk students. And at-risk students tend to generally refer to non-completion or dropping out. Um, it's important to think that students who have poor transition don't necessarily drop out. Um, it can just, mean, can just be an effect on their, their achievement as they go through. Um, and it's also important to realise that this, this load of literature is actually full of sweeping generalisations. Um, every student is an individual. Whatever characteristics they're coming towards you with, um, they are entering higher education with optimism um, of being successful. So um, do try to see each of them as an individual. <clears throat> If we move to class and cohort connectedness, sorry, there's a lot of uh, information on this slide. Um, there are two main considerations here. Uh, the first one is connections between and within groups of students. Um, and then there's connections between students and their instructors. So schools and colleges will run on a, a, on a pretty strict routine. Um, we work on a two weekly, two weekly timetable and it's the same every fortnight. Um, we have the same classes at the same time. Those classes are the same length with the same teachers um, for the whole year, two years, five years, seven years. Um, they're potentially sitting with the same peers. I know that's the case in my classroom, you'll sit next to the same people. Um, so that connectedness is quite easy for them to achieve. They, they know where they sit within, within their cohort. Teachers in schools know their students really, really well as well. Um, if you take any student in my year 12 class, I'd be able to tell you a lot about them, their likes, their dislikes, their aspirations. I've met their parents. Um, so that's a very, very different relationship that we've got. Um, particularly for this post COVID semester that's coming up, it's worth remembering for chemistry and higher education that the lab is a place where lots of connections happen and potentially we're not gonna have that in the semester that's coming up either. Um, so how we're gonna facilitate that. Um, with this in mind, I've got a couple of case studies for you to have a look at, for you to consider the environment that these 16 to 18 year olds are learning in before they get to you. This is my school. Um, we are a very big and busy boys grammar school in Greater Manchester. Um, we're a fee paying school. We've got a significant pro proportion of our boys are on financial support though. Very socially and culturally mixed, although academically selective. I will teach the sons of taxi drivers alongside those of doctors and footballers all religions and non-present in our community. You can see there, we've got a very defined routine within our sixth form experience and it's quite school-like. Um, they, they don't have loads and loads of freedom. Um, although a lot of the activities that we have there are to build things like leadership skills. Um, I do a lot of work at the RSC with different schools and colleges. Um, this is a, a large sixth form college. They can have cohorts of around 500 each year studying A-level chemistry. Um, the routines in this kind of environment are a little bit more like university. They've got a lot more free time. Um, they don't have to be on site all the time. Um, they get less regular tutor contact, though, um, in terms of pastoral care um, and much greater freedom with, with what they do with their time. So um, maybe transition will be less challenging if your environment from 16 to 18 is more like a university. So teaching, learning and feedback. Um, as I said before, schools run on routine, regular classes, same classrooms, same schedule of work. Um, I think chemistry in HE has a huge potential to be very different to school because of the very different types of classes. I've given you examples of what we have at Manchester um, and the different sizes of those classes and the different teaching approaches. So that is in complete contrast to what you would see at school. If we think about feedback specifically, um, we give loads of feedback in school classes. Um, 
some that's verbal through questioning and coaching when you're just having those discussions with students um, we also write annotations on their classwork on their homework i am not saying it's always read and acted on um, but students will be used to some routines in a kind of feedback loop um, they may be used to redoing their work or taking retests um, but most important really is that the feedback is in the context of the relationship between the teacher and the student which is already strong um, and because of those relationships we can be quite honest um, for those of the, you who know me in this community it probably comes as no surprise that I am well known in school for my brutal honesty I have sat down in front of parents and said your son is lazy um, because sometimes you do need to say those things um, to students but that's on the back of a very personal relationship that's there and you can be honest in students that you have strong relationships with um, and, and feedback needs to be honest if it's going to help students to be successful. Um, in terms of curriculum structures, uh, schools have really fixed syllabuses, as you probably know. You could go to the websites for various exam boards and download them, and we have the national curriculum as well. That's the same in most countries. Um, and because of that, it does lend itself to a whole plethora of commercial and grassroots resources. If you just type in higher chemistry or A-level chemistry into the internet, you'll get so many different resources. Um, even though we all roughly teach the same concepts in, in the early years, um, higher education chemistry syllabuses are really flexible. Um, and that's quite alien to students, this idea that it's not a fit it is a fixed thing because you've had to define your ILOs at the start of the course um but the fact that your chemistry course may be different to somebody who's studying chemistry at another institution is quite an alien concept to them also those ILOs are not necessarily accessible to students whereas a syllabus document written by a UK exam board would be written with all stakeholders in mind including parents um it's a similar message with assessment our structures are really fixed but there are advantages to this in terms of the accessibility of the assessments we put in place. Um, all these things have been thought about. They have been checked. It's rare that you get an error in a UK exam paper. It does happen, but very, very rare. Um, students are very used to exams, um, but actually, I think particularly in this post-COVID semester, um, changes to assessment because we won't necessarily be able to run exams are going to put them in some unfamiliar territory. Um, coursework has not been a feature of 16 to 18 education for quite a while. They won't have much experience of tests that have been taken on a computer um, and they certainly won't really know much about coursework assignments that have fixed deadlines because they're used to some flex the tendency to treat it like homework with a little bit of flexibility about it how am i doing for time not too bad okay so just a couple of slides um before we move into discussion about the impact of this COVID pandemic on student subject knowledge as they move to transition to undergraduate study this autumn. Um, we've got a paper coming out in JKM Ed, it's just, um, just dealing with the technical editing at the moment. Um, and this is um, drawing on the literature around this and a survey we did of over 100 teachers of 16 to 18 year olds. Um, and you can probably see there that most teachers feel that students will have less strong subject knowledge this year. Um, a quick one slide summary of what we found out. Um, forgetting is natural and I think sometimes we forget that as well and, and, and feel frustrated when students have forgotten things but it is a natural process. Um, it does become a bigger issue when there's longer time periods involved so if we've got students who've not studied for six months um, it's a bigger issue if you um, are recruiting their students not at the top level of prior achievement as well. Um, they will have forgotten a lot. Certain topics will be more affected than others. Um, the, lo the loss of exams has been a, been a big issue for teachers in motivating students to get involved with study after lockdown. So as soon as exams were cancelled, that essentially took that big carrot and stick out um, for students. Learning loss of the summer is actually really well documented already in school populations um, and gets worse as you get older as well. Uh, so the teachers feel that um, if you teach organic chemistry and synthetic transformations that the, that's going to be where the, the biggest gaps are going to be um, and it is really for instructors in HE to decide if those gaps really matter. Um, teachers when we ask them about what should we do about this they've favoured a very holistic approach to intervention 
um, in the early year, early kind of weeks of a semester um, rather than a kind of pre-university course as well. So a little bit of a, a summary really. I, I'm aware that I've essentially presented you with a load of points to think about and no solutions. Um, that's because in reality there aren't any generic solutions uh, that can just be universally applied to you that I could give you and will help you have a successful transition for all your students. Um, the solutions, but I wouldn't even say there were solutions, they're more kind of mitigations, are as individual as your institutions and the individuals that come to your institutions. But I hope I have given you some food for thought on that, um, about what the school environment is like um, and how that would be give you some um, challenges as far as transitions concerned. I am happy to take any questions. Um, I've prompted some discussion points for you there. Um, happy to chat over the video chat or you are welcome to answer or discuss within the chat, either of those things. And I think I just about managed that. All right, thanks, uh, Christy. So we have about 10 minutes um, for chat. So um, how, how do you want the structure this? Do you want to take it point by point maybe and people could type in some prompts about the first question just to keep it a bit structured? I mean, I suppose my own sense of the biggest worry about transition um, is not so much the content knowledge, although that was an interesting point about the school teachers, but um, just the the, the you pointed sort of normal structural things that loosen a lot in school to university and I just worry or I'm wondering about the much more extreme structural loosening that will happen in coming into a uh, quote unquote uh, hybrid learning uh, world. So I'll, I'll let you, if you can see the chat, I'll let you take um, that Dave Otway has typed in something there. Um, that's probably the first uh, Prompt for you if you want to pick that up. Yeah, so David, um, yeah, I think you're right in difficulty knowing who you've got in the class. If um, the mixture is certainly we're going to synchronous and asynchronous, um, and there are advantages to both, but certainly for, for students who are used to running to a timetable, synchronous is easier in many ways because it removes the motivation issue if you have to log on at a particular time but yeah and potentially not knowing who your students are um because they haven't ever logged on to anything that you've been teaching on is an issue so i mean on, on that point it's interesting because we, we are looking at an option of essentially flip i suppose so the material will be available in advance um yeah. but we're going to keep the lecture slots in the timetable and lecturers will be Right. Essentially speaking to students in those times live, hopefully, um, as a kind of a review. So it'd be sort of, well, in earlier years, very much a prompting review. So we looked at this topic in the pre recordings. Let's talk about, you know, uh, which has pros and cons. But I mean, do you, how, how, do you, how do you think new, new to university students will cope with that kind of setup? And the other side of the parallel question about size of institution, which I think is also important. Yeah, so I think I think that's a real issue because I, I think there's been a lot of assumptions made about this generation and online learning, um, and particularly these year 13s, whereas my current year 12s, I would have had no issue with them because I've been teaching them and we've been teaching over Zoom and things like that. Whereas the year 13s, they I would have had a pre-university course, but most of them won't have had any teaching from school, so they wouldn't they're not used to to They've not had a kind of bridge where they've been logging onto Zoom and doing sessions with their teacher. So they start to get used to the technology. So they're going to have the technology on top of not knowing who you are um, and, you know, being in a, in a big lecture. So you're there on the lecture. There are another two. I don't know how big your cohort is, but there are 200 other students there in a the lecture. The etiquette of just managing this kind of thing can be quite difficult as well. Are school universities and schools working with one another? Do they know what they teach and the expectations of the students' knowledge? I, I, I would hope so. I've been doing this for five years now, but you know, um, potentially, I, I do think there are um, for our colleagues who are less teaching focused, um, who teach in the early years of undergraduate study. I, I do think some of them will just keep the trusty old revision guide on the um, bookcase in the office, 
and, and occasionally look at that. Um, or if they've got a kid that's that age, I found that that tends to be a bit of a prompt. So there's a question there from you, Herbert, online icebreakers, especially relating to breakout rooms. Have you had any success? I mean, how, how have you engaged in, in final year school pupils and in, in sort of, I mean, I suppose they know each other, but... Um, yeah, they do know each other. University, any ideas for online icebreakers? I, mean, I hate icebreakers. <laughs> so we're um, academics. That's in our nature. Students might like them. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. I, I think that's part of the thing. As you get older, you do get more cautious anyway and cynical. Um, and hopefully, they won't arrive cautious and cynical for us. Um, so you could use that wonderful emoji quiz I was doing just recently. That that caused quite a lot of amusement. Um, um, Bunny's asking about content. So this is something I've sort of brushed over myself because I sort of feel, oh, we'll just fix it. But actually, perhaps it is something that needs to be considered. I think you mentioned or, or you have some sense of particular content topics that might might be difficult. So are, are, there, are there traditionally contents that come toward the end of a school cycle that maybe pupils have missed out on? Um, well, we asked teachers about what you, they thought that would normally be an issue. Um, core phys chem, um, in terms of the higher kinetics, um, so rate equations and, and Arrhenius, um, and also the, the more advanced topics in thermodynamics, including entropy and Gibbs free energy, were the things that generally they thought, even on a normal year, would be an issue moving forward. Um, and then they really were really big on synthetic organic transformations. I think it was that kind of bigger picture thing. Um, because they'll have taught each of the classifications of functional groups and that kind of thing, but actually seeing how that fits together into a big reaction scheme. But then the academic in me as an organic chemist was like, well, that actually probably doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm actually not that fussed that they know how those things fit together because we're going to be starting small again. We're going to be starting from bonding models again when they start in September anyway. So I actually don't think it's as as much of an issue that they, they couldn't give you a reaction scheme to move from a... Um, nitro through to a primary amine or whatever. Yeah, that's what I, I'm sort of wondering. Is it more confidence issues than a knowledge issue? That they may feel that they don't know stuff or that they're behind. They may feel uh, a deficit because they haven't had an A level saying you have got an A or yes. B, whatever it is. Whereas actually, and let's be honest, they mightn't particularly know gives free energy or entropy or anything like that apart from plugging and chugging the numbers. Um, yeah. uh, I teach that in my first year, they mightn't know it after that course either. Um, but but I suppose is there a sense or a, a situation that we need to think about in terms of promoting um, a bit more confidence in what they do know and, and what can we do in the early stages of university to promote that? Yeah, I think you're right there. I think there's been a lot of thought that maybe students are, are like, oh yeah, I didn't have to do my exams, but actually many of them do feel that they've been, they've had that opportunity to prove themselves snatched away. Um, and they've been building up to that and they've not had that test of knowledge. So they, 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 they have the potential to be very unsure when they arrive in September because they've not had that proof. Um, so I was in a TNL meeting yesterday, we were talking about um, prompting some reflection in students um, and using some diagnostics with the purpose of the diagnostics, not to tell them what they don't know, but actually more to help them prove what they do know um, in a kind of open book way um, so that they, they start to kind of personalise their learning journey. And it's not just being done to them, um, that they do recognise they are coming with prior knowledge. Um, Patrick has a prompt there, which, which um, perhaps makes for uncomfortable reading, but are, are we just seeing essentially a much bigger version of many transition issues that perhaps are always there? That yeah, yeah I, I do think this has always been there. And to be honest, I don't think it, it's been dealt with very well. We've got oh, we've worked on it on the basis that we are people and we see these people face to face. And, and when that's taken away from us, um, I think what we haven't been doing as far as student transition is actually laid bare a little bit when we haven't had the lab and those those kind of structures that help us it does make me wonder if you were teaching say maths and you didn't have a lab and those other kind of structures what would they do in order to bring kind of cohort connectedness because I, I think maybe we're a bit lazy because we can rely on those things and you know that more informal environment where you can chat to you to someone while you're getting your ice or while your reaction is stirring 
Yeah, I, I think I think the lab issue is going to be huge. Yeah. Yeah. So do I. Um, well, yeah. I mean, but not for reasons to do with labs, but more to do re reasons to do with connectedness. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think we will. Um, unless there's any further questions, I just see Elizabeth coming in here. Um, yeah, so there's a time zone. That's actually something we haven't really talked yeah. about, time zone issues. Maybe that can be the last point we want to finish up on. Just, I suppose, taking a step back and looking at, we're going to have these students perhaps across 18 time zones, um, and we want to build a community. What, what, can we, what can we take from knowing about what students are coming in with the capital, capitalize on? I mean, you know, I mean, I feel a little bit old fashioned talking about discussion boards and so on. I mean, what, what, what kind of things can we use to tap into getting students to talk to each other? I'll, and I'll leave that as sure sort of your outro. <laughs> yeah, I'm really not sure about working across time zones, to be honest. Um, and you, well, I don't, it depends how many you have in those time zones, doesn't it, really? Um, I will, I'll be around for most of the morning here and there. I've got to bake a cake and do other things, but I'll, I'll be around in the background. So do feel free to, to drop me a, a message and I'll keep popping back on. Oops. <laughs> Continually muted. Well, I will say thank you very much, um, Christy. I think you've given a lot, given us a lot to talk to think about in terms of uh, essentially the issues associated with um, what we need to think about with students arriving in September, what their own experience has been with school, and in, in a way, I think the most enlightening thing for me is awareness of their tech savviness or not, and, and perhaps the breadth in that, and, and in our rush to put everything hybridized online and so on. We perhaps need to think about that. So thank you very much. Um, and as you say, you're around the people want to bounce questions off you, but we will move smoothly on. And thank you for bringing me back on time to uh, Catherine Haxton. Um, so Catherine, I'll, I'll let you share your screen while I introduce you. Um, but Catherine is from Keele University um, and someone who we, uh, many in this community know very well. Um, she does a lot of work and I suppose the reason I have thought about it for this is she does a lot of work and a lot of thinking around um sorry I just want to stop recording.